The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. In this analysis, Mr. Searchinger draws upon research material especially prepared for these broadcasts by eminent historians. And now, Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. This week, the Security Council of the United Nations tackled the most important and critical job of its career. I mean, of course, the discussion of the closely allied problems of disarmament and atomic control. Disarmament is an old subject in international relations with a stormy and not very cheerful history. The atomic bomb, ever since it was dropped over Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, has been the all-overshadowing factor in great power relationships. It has, moreover, given the question of disarmament a new urgency, an urgency that must be met by a corresponding energy and genius in statecraft. For nothing less than the survival of the civilized nations of this world is involved. <clears throat> the urgency of atomic control became apparent to the statesmen of the great powers during the first meetings of the Council of Foreign Ministers in London in the fall of 1945. Discussions in the Council were unexpectedly acrimonious, dealing as they did with conflicting Russian and Western ideas regarding the peace settlements with the Axis satellites. A deadlock was reached, and the deadlock was not broken until the so-called atomic powers, the United States, Britain, and Canada, had met in Washington and decided to remove the hidden irritant of our relations with Russia, namely our monopoly of the atomic bomb. The result was Mr. Burns' urgent flight to Moscow in Christmas week, 1945. <clears throat> the most important result of this emergency conference in Moscow was an agreement between the big three to recommend to the United Nations the creation of an Atomic Energy Commission, which was to prepare proposals for the international control of the use of atomic bombs. The commission was duly authorized when the United Nations met in London for the first time. On January 24th, a little over a year ago, the General Assembly as accepted unanimously the recommendations to the Commission. It's important to remember what they were. First, the exchange of basic scientific information regarding atomic energy for peaceful industry. Then, the control of atomic energy so as to ensure its use for peaceful purposes only. Then, the elimination of atomic weapons and other major weapons of mass destruction from national armaments. And finally, the protection of complying states against the hazards of violation through inspection and other methods. Those were the terms of reference of the Atomic Energy Commission. The commission consisted of the representatives of the 11 nations on the Council plus Canada and was to report to the Security Council, in which, as you know, the five great powers have the veto. Mr. Bernard M. Baruch was appointed our representative on the commission, which first met at Hunter College in New York last June. The American representative presented a fully developed plan for atomic control based on the famous Atchison Lilienthal report, which was prepared for the State Department. Professor Harold C. Urey, one of the leading scientists associated with the atomic research, called this report as the most elaborate, thoughtful, and far-sighted proposal that had been brought to public attention by any group, public or private, since the atomic bomb burst over Hiroshima. This atchison lilienthal report, as I said, became the basis of the so-called Baruch Plan, which the United States presented to the Commission. Roughly, the plan provides for an international atomic development authority, which is to control not only the production of all atomic energy in significant quantities, but the mining of the raw materials with which it is produced, uranium and thorium. It is to have power to forbid the use of atomic energy for any but peaceful purposes. It is to have the unrestricted right of inspection in all countries to make sure that its regulations are being observed. But the Baruch Plan adds something else, and this has become the great bone of contention between us and the Soviet Union. It adds the imposition of what Mr. Baruch calls condign punishments of nations which violate or evade the regulations. And it states that the veto power exercised by the great powers in the Security Council shall not apply to the system of inspection and punishments. 
The Russians, who submitted a plan of their own, strongly objected to this, saying that any abrogation of the veto violates the Charter of the United Nations. They do not, in principle, object to inspection, as Mr. Molotov indicated in the course of the discussions on disarmament. But they think that the veto is completely irrelevant in connection with inspection. Now, some people jump to the conclusion that the Russians are, in fact, stalling on the inspection deal. But against that, it must be said that they have consistently refused in all discussions to compromise their veto power, which is their only defense against an inevitable pro-Western majority vote. We, incidentally, hold just as tightly to the veto on every subject but atomic energy. But in that subject, of course, we still have the bomb. As you know, despite the Russians' bitter opposition, through about 60 commission and committee meetings spread over six months, the United States delegation finally won. That is, the commission voted for the Baruch plan, 10 to nothing, with the Russians and Poles abstaining. But it was soon realized that this was a rather empty victory, since the final decision rests with the Security Council, in which there must be unanimity of the Big Five. Moreover, the Russians discovered a way of renewing their opposition on another plane, namely on the broader plane of general disarmament. The Atomic Commission did duly report to the Council in favor of the Baruch Plan, but the Council also had before it an earlier resolution, passed unanimously by the General Assembly, which calls on the Security Council to take practical measures for the regulation and reduction of all armaments to prohibit the use of atomic and other major weapons of destruction, to expedite the discussion of the Atomic Commission's reports, and to give prompt consideration to practicable and effective safeguards in connection with both disarmament and atomic control. Everything you notice is to be expedited. Nothing is given priority. Well, Mr. Vromico took the line that the whole is greater than any of its parts, and therefore, general disarmament should come first. Our delegation, however, wanted to take first things first and considered the atom problem number one. So here was a first-class procedural debate that might delay progress indefinitely. The issue is between the United States and Russia, but the lesser powers have been trying to find an acceptable compromise. The compromise is that the Council will consider both general disarmament and the atomic control resolution alongside each other. But here is another snag. We want to make sure that the first will not overlap or interfere with the second. In other words, we don't want to take a chance of a disarmament agreement coming into force, inspection and all, before we have secured completely watertight safeguards against any possible future use of atomic weapons by anybody. Obviously, any general inspection system at this stage could reveal vital secrets here, and not much anywhere else. So, we want to have it in writing that any disarmament commission that may be set up will be forbidden to concern itself with atomic energy control. That was the subject of the special committee, which reached a complete deadlock on Friday. But what is really behind this terrific struggle over mere procedure? It's only natural that we, having the atomic bomb, want to settle the question of control on our terms, while we still have it alone, and therefore have the whip hand. The Baruch plan provides for the liquidation of our monopoly by degrees. We will permit no inspection, give up no technical information, turn over no plans to the international authority, destroy no stockpiles until our proposed machinery of inspection and punishment is actually functioning, unimpeded by the veto power. It is equally clear that the Russians will not give up their precious veto so long as they can always be outvoted and so long as we exercise overwhelming influence by the very fact of having atomic energy at our command. We are today the most powerful nation in the world, and all but a small group of countries living in the shadow of Soviet Russia look to us for protection in a world where collective security is still only a dream. But it is we, the torchbearers of peace and democracy, to whom the world at large looks for leadership in disarmament. So once again, as in the case of the peace treaties, we are the nation that is in a hurry to get results, 
while the Russians, in all probability, are most likely to benefit by delay. There is no doubt that atomic research is going on in Russia as well as, as elsewhere. And the scientists tell us there is in fact no such thing as an atomic secret. Within anywhere from three to ten years, the Russians might be in possession of atomic bombs or something equally terrible. General Leslie R. Groves, who headed up the Manhattan Project, said the other day that if he were to make a guess, he would say five years. Once those hypothetical five years are up, the Russians might argue, they can settle the issue on equal terms with us. In the meantime, the real difficulty is lack of trust. They don't altogether trust us, and we don't trust them. At least, many of our less responsible public men have said so on many occasions. The Russians point to the history of Allied intervention in Bolshevik times and to the long record of non-recognition and open Western hostility leading up to Munich and the Nazi-Soviet pact. We, for our part, continue to harp on ideological and physical Soviet penetration since VE Day. There have been plenty of journalistic attacks on both sides, and that hasn't improved the atmosphere. But no single factor has poisoned the atmosphere more directly than our monopoly of the atomic bomb, the fact that we have actually demonstrated its monstrous destructive power, that we have continued to experiment with it, and are accumulating stockpiles of bombs, while the whole world is agreed that the bomb must be outlawed if civilization is to survive. So, however difficult the task, we are morally bound to arrive at a compromise that will take us out of the present impasse. The abortive attempt at disarmament in the 20s and 30s was followed by an armament race, followed by a devastating war. A similar failure in controlling atomic weapons would almost certainly result in an atomic armaments race. But there is one tremendous difference in the previous armaments races and an atomic one. In previous wars, the industrially stronger powers won out in the long run. In the atomic war, according to the scientists, there would be no long run. The race would be not necessary to the strongest, but only to the swiftest in making the initial attack. For atomic power aims at the sources of all power, the industrial and population centers. And in this respect, the highly urbanized and industrialized nation is the most vulnerable. The race, in fact, would begin not merely with the production and stockpiling of bombs and the perfecting of fast methods of delivery. It would also begin with the dispersal of industries. In this, the Soviet Union would have the advantage, since it is still in the early stages of development and still has vast open spaces. In fact, Russian industry is being dispersed as it grows. This is what Professor Yuri said in a recent foreign policy report. The existing situation with respect to the atomic bomb must of necessity change in a comparatively short time. The proposals that must be made to avoid destruction by the atomic bomb involve important changes in the organization of human society. And those changes must be brought about in a few years if World War No. 3 is to be avoided and if atomic bombs are not to be used in another conflict. There is no adequate defense against atomic bombs made in large numbers and delivered by the variety of methods now available. The day after the Hiroshima bomb, President Truman declared that the bomb was the most revolutionary weapon ever known to man and steps should be taken to protect mankind from its further use. Those steps are presumably being taken. But today, 18 months later, we are still far from positive results. Yet, says Mr. Austin, our chief delegate, we are nearer to real security and disarmament than we have ever been before. Hope he's right. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations in cooperation with the American Historical Association have presented Caesar Searchinger with the story behind the headlines. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.